Worcester State University presents Dr. Imu Asiku speaking in the Worcester State University Fuller Theater. Developments in Medicine and Neuroscience, a Physician's Perspective. Uh, I am Tom McNamara, the Vice President of Institutional Advancement here at Worcester State University. And my office is so proud to have the honor of welcoming one of our most distinguished alumni back to campus today, Dr. Imu Isaku, class of 1992. He has made his alma mater very proud. We are delighted that he will be sharing his thoughts on the future of neuroscience in medicine with us today. It is my distinct pleasure to thank our dignitaries for joining us for the special event with us on stage. We have Lieutenant Governor Tim Murray, Senate Harry Chandler, Senator Harry Chandler, Senator, Mass Board of Higher Education Chairman Dr. Charles Desmond, Gladys Rodriguez Parker, Senior District Director from Congressman Jim McGovern's office. And I also want to take a moment to thank our lead sponsors whose support has made this special event possible. Fairlawn Rehabilitation Hospital and Charter Communications, as well as the Brain Injury Association of Massachusetts, the University of Massachusetts Medical School, and Davis Advertising for, for providing additional underwriting support. Now brings me great pleasure to welcome the chairman of our Board of Trustees, John Brissett, to the podium. Thank you, Tom. I first want to recognize uh, with us uh, Dr. Janelle Ashley. I want to thank her for her incredible leadership she has provided to our campus over the past nine years. As you all know, she is preparing to retire this summer, and we will greatly miss her. Dr. Ashley. <laughs> Seated with Dr. Ashley this morning, is a very special guest whose attendance is a surprise for our distinguished leader, lecturer this morning. My professor, when I was here at Worcester State, uh, Worcester State University, Professor Emeritus, Dr. O.J. Asiko, Dr. Imo's e father. It's funny, I met him this morning and he said, I knew you'd be a university when I came back, and we are a university. Uh, Dr. Dr. Uh, O.J. Asiku has traveled all the way from his home in Virginia to surprise his son to share in this special day. Uh, we're very excited that you uh, made a trip here uh, to, to be with here, and I know your son is incredibly humble that you're with him today. It is now make my great honor to introduce a great friend to Worcester State University, our Lieutenant Governor, Tim Murray. Thank you, Chairman Brissett. It's a pleasure to be here uh, at Worcester State University uh, with Dr. Siku uh, as we welcome him back proudly. Uh, I also want to recognize my colleagues in government who are here, Senator Chandler. I know City Councilor uh, Connie Lukes is here, and she's a neighbor of this great uh, institution. Uh, uh, we also have uh, uh, Chairman of the, the Board of Higher Education, Charles Desmond, uh, who is with us as well and uh, Gladys Rodriguez-Parker, who's here representing Congress and McGovern. And like uh, John Brissett, I want to thank President Ashley for, for her service that she's given this community for nine years, uh, uh, and she will be missed. For me, as a native of, native of Worcester and a former mayor, uh, I always appreciate the opportunity to partner with local officials in the community that, that helps advance the cities, the regions, and the Commonwealth's goals. Uh, this is especially gratifying, uh, being uh, the son of a Worcester State University graduate, uh, having a couple former teachers that I had uh, here uh, who were Worcester State uh, grads uh, who taught me in the Worcester Public Schools. It's great to see uh, and, and, and celebrate this story. Uh, Governor Patrick and I have worked hard with a lot of the stakeholders to invest in higher education, to invest in education across the board because we know how important it is. Uh, the, the, the higher ed bond bill which we passed with Senator Chandler and the legislature has allowed us to make new investments on so many of our community colleges, uh, universities, and the UMass system that have been needed for some time. 
uh, and we know that Dr. Siku is uh, also someone who believes strongly in education, and I would point out public education. Uh, and when he talks about, and we'll, we'll, we'll hear from him uh, a little bit, a little bit about uh, how uh, that experience changed his life, uh, where he not only earned his bachelor's of science in biology, but also his medical degree from what we think is the best medical school in the country, uh, uh, over by Lake Quinsigam and UMass Medical School. He's even tied further to the city through his father, who was introduced uh, earlier, who taught uh, here at Worcester State, uh, and his mother, Brenda, who was retired from teaching special education at Burncoat Middle School. He recognizes education and health care and the sciences as top priorities here at Worcester State University uh, and in the Commonwealth and in our nation. And as the chair of the Governor's Advisory Committee on STEM, Science, Technology, Engineering, Math, you really represent uh, what we want all of our young people today to aspire to. Uh, you have made your mark uh, uh, in your career, uh, and we know you're going to continue to do great things. You work as Director of Neurocritical Care at the Missioner Neuroscience Institute at Memorial Hermann in Texas uh, in a very tragic and difficult moment. Uh, really spoke, I think, about your upbringing, the quality of your education, uh, and your character in a very uh, difficult moment. Uh, so we want to thank you for your commitment, your dedication uh, to science, to Worcester State University, uh, and to the Commonwealth. Uh, I just want to apologize in advance. I'm uh, going to be leaving to go to Boston. We have a Supreme Court confirmation hearing today, which I have to chair. But I, I look forward. To, I'm just honored to be able to meet you and, and to, to bring the greetings of the Commonwealth and say how immensely proud of we are of your accomplishments and your story, because we know it will inspire uh, lots of students who are currently at this school and those who are on the waiting list uh, in, in, uh, 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 in that those that have been admitted uh, to this great uh, university. So thanks again. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Uh, we really appreciate you taking time to be here with us today. Um, we know you have a busy day in Boston, and any time you can come to Worcester State, uh, is, is, uh, you're more than welcome any time, and we appreciate you doing that. Uh, it's now my privilege to welcome uh, to the podium a proud Worcester State alumna and dear friend of ours, representing Congressman Jim McGovern's office, Gladys Rodriguez Parker. Good morning, and uh, buenos dias. I, um, the last time I was in this room, I didn't need glasses. I broke my glasses the other day, and right now everything is a little fuzzy. I don't need those, John. I can still see close up. <laughs> um, it is an honor for me to represent Congressman McGovern and to offer um, some, some remarks on his behalf, to welcome Dr. Isiku back to Worcester, to welcome him back to Worcester State University, and um, along with his family. Um, as you know, uh, some months ago, there was a, a tragedy in this country, and um, Dr. Isiku was one of the um, doctors that um, worked with, uh, with, the, with the Gabby Giffords family. And on the day that the country was asked to um, um, honor her um, by, by performing a, a moment of silence, the whole country came together. And we were honestly across the way over at Flag Street School, um, the congressman and I and a group of sixth graders. And we could not have been prouder on that day. Those sixth graders asked questions. They knew who she was. Unfortunately, under those tragic circumstances, um, for your service to Gabby Giffords, um, his friend, thank you. And we, of course, through you, um, send her our best wishes um, from the city of Worcester. On a personal note, I can't remember a time when I walked the halls of Worcester State University with two children on, in tow when Dr. Isiku wasn't trying to get me to take one of his biology classes. <laughs> I never really did. I, did. Um, I, I, um, I ended up graduating from here, however, and then I went to work in a little program um, called the, um, um, the Summer Enrichment Program at UMass Medical School, where I met the wonderful Lillian Goodman 
and all of these people. So I, today, I just feel like I'm home. And um, we recruited a young man, Dr. Raisiku, to participate in a four-week program, where I believe you were housed here. I'm not sure, but I think that we rented space for the evenings at Worcester State University. It was the best of times. It was the best time um, having these college students um, from all over the state, Dr. Isiko included, and the dreams that they had. And so to stand here today and to see how someone with all that aspiration, all of those dreams um, running through them, and then to see them coming out and seeing what's possible. I can't think of any other tribute more important. Um, I do have to say that we still in this country have a um, problem with what we call underrepresented minority students in the science and the math. And I'm always trying to push um, our young people, and I know that Dr. Isiko um, joins me in pushing the science and math and technology education with our children while they're very young. So we were talking about some of the efforts that Worcester State University is, is, t is taking on. So Dr. Isiku, I think that you left the university in, in, um, in really good stead. And um, congratulations. And I am so honored to be, um, uh, to be um, united, reunited with you. Thank you. Thank you, Gladys. And please pass on our wishes to the congressman. We, we, we miss him. It is now my pleasure to welcome uh, a no stranger to Worcester State, a great friend uh, who has been an incredible supporter not only to Worcester State, but to public education, but specifically public higher education, uh, Senator Harriet Chandler. Thank you, John, and the entire Worcester State University family, because you are a family here, I feel that. And from what everyone has said to today, it's clear that the relationships are very strong and the, the bonds are very tight here. Uh, and I thank you spe specifically for the opportunity to join you this morning. And thank you, Dr. Isiku, for returning to Worcester to share your inspirational story and to speak to us about the great strides that medicine is taking in the field of neuroscience and medicine. I very much look forward, Dr. Isiku, to your remarks. I think we all remember clearly the day that Representative Gibbons was shot in the massacre in Tucson and the heroic efforts of so many, including her staff, to bring an end to the bloodshed, with some actually ending in the place. Thankfully, Representative Gibbons survived. He continues to improve and plans on being in person for her husband's space shuttle flight the day after the night. And among others, Dr. Hasek was a key reason for that. Thank you for that. On behalf of the Massachusetts State Senate, welcome home to Worcester Doctors and to Worcester State University. And thank you for all that you do. And thank you again, everyone, for the opportunity to share what promises to be an interesting and informative presentation. And I'm delighted to have with me for you, Dr. Uh, a citation, an official citation from the State Senate of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Let me read it. Be it known that the Massachusetts Senate Hereby extends its congratulations to Dr. Yu and Siko in recognition of their continued leadership and support of research and scholarship at Worcester State University. And be it further known, the Massachusetts Senate extends best wishes for continued success. If this citation be duly signed by the President of the Senate, we attest it to and a copy there of transmitted by the Clerk of the Senate. Signed by the President of the Senate, signed by the Clerk of the Senate, and I am very grateful. Privilege. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Chandler. And once again, thank you for your support here, Mr. State. It's truly, we gratefully appreciate everything you do for us. It's now my privilege and honor to introduce to you Dr. Charles Desmond, Chairman of the Board of Higher Education for the State of Massachusetts. Dr. Desmond is a Fulbright Scholar prior to his Board of Higher Education Service was Executive Vice President of the Treffler Foundation, a nonprofit dedicated to improving educational opportunities and success for the Boston urban youth. 
Prior to Truffler, Charlie worked for 30 years at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, with a focus on student affairs and community collaboration. He was Associate Chancellor for School Community Collaboration, Vice President for Student Affairs, Director of the Pre-Freshman Programs, Project Director of College Preparatory Program Upward Bound, among other positions. He has also served as a guidance counselor at Northeastern University's African American Institute and in the Boston Public Schools. Charlie earned his, his EAPD in instructional leadership from the University of Massachusetts Amherst and a BS in sociology from Northeastern University. Please join me in welcoming the Chair of the Board of Higher Ed, Charlie Desmond. Thank you, Mr. Especially, I'm glad to be here myself to hear what you have to share with us this morning. First of all, let me say, how many uh, students do we have here in the room today? Raise your hand if you're a student. Okay, we're outnumbered by students. I have no So, uh, the reason that I, I wanted to use students to raise your hand is because I want you to imagine a future for yourself that would be beyond what you are presently able to think about. That is that you will probably be doing something in the future that you aren't even able to imagine today. And that that's what the transformative power of an institution like Worcester State College holds for you. I was talking this morning earlier about Dr. Siku's uh, background. And I understand that when he first came to Worcester State College, he had not thought about going into medicine, not inter intervening in the historical events of this nation and the world in the manner in which he has uh, over the last several months. And all of that happened, all of that changed as a result of his experiences here at Worcester State University, which laid the foundation for a career in medicine that we're all heralding today. So I think that as you students um, think about what you're saying today and what you're hearing today, you have to recognize that you're, you're eyewitnesses to history. You're seeing something that is going to happen in your own life. And that one day we may be sitting in this very room honoring one of you because of something that happened because of perhaps maybe what you're here today or something that could happen tomorrow at Worcester State University. And I want you to realize that there's no limits to what it is that you're capable of doing and that the university exists to allow you to achieve at the limits of your potential. One thing that I've learned in all of the work that I've done in higher education, and I've been in this field for a long time, um, there are many distinguished scholars in this room that are sitting here today that are doing research on the cutting edges of the disciplines that they're working in. But I can assure you that there's not one scientist in this room or at any university in the country that can tell you what the limits of your potential are. What the limits of your potential are will be driven by your desire Make the most of the education that's available to you and to work as hard as you possibly can to develop the skills and the talents and the abilities that you are and to apply those skill, uh, skills and abilities to challenges that you see facing us in the world today, as Dr. Isaacman has been doing. Think about what the world would look like today had he not made the choices that he made uh, relative to his own professional development in his career. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's hard for us to imagine how an institution like this one has now intersected, a ripple on the tide of our history and in our lives has intersected to change the affairs of this nation and have the people of the world riveted on decisions and actions that are being made by a student that came out of Worcester State University. Now, I travel all over the state of Massachusetts talking about public education and particularly talking about youth students. And I tell people that public education is the greatest, most important, most significant investment that we possibly can make in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And I tell people that the students that we get in our public colleges and universities are the best students in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. They may not have wealthy, rich parents. They may not come from um, storied families that have distinguished backgrounds and historical names that go back to the Mayflower and what have you. But these are students who are trying to get an education and who want to make a difference, not only in their communities, but they want to make a difference for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So public higher education really is important, and the work that you're doing is critical and vital to the health and vitality of the state and to the Commonwealth and to the 
country as a whole. So uh, let me say that as I look around the room today, I see many, many, many people that are very proud and honored uh, to be associated with Worcester State University and this outstanding young man that we have uh, sitting to my left way over here. It's a great, excuse me, a great day for public higher education and it's a testimony to our work. It's a validation of our work. It underscores the significance of our work and what we've been saying for so many years about public education. Next week is Horace Mann's birthday. I, <laughs> I sit in the seat that Horace Mann once sat in as the chairman of the Board of Higher Education. And I cannot imagine how happy, I can't imagine how delighted, I can't imagine how just elated he would be to know that his vision of education in Massachusetts is being fulfilled in the actions and the work of not only you faculty members and administrators that are here, but the graduates that you're producing, such as this wonderful, amazing, gifted young man that's sitting to the left here. As you all know, he's the vice chair and chief director <coughs> in the neurosurgery department at the University of Texas Medical School. I just got new glasses, so I'm I keep looking at the piece of paper. Um, at Memorial Herman Hospital in Houston, Texas. He's part of the team, as you heard earlier, that uh, worked on a uh, representative of behavioral difference. The good doctor's medical journey began here. And I don't want any of us to forget that. Everything has a beginning. Roots have to be planted somewhere, and we have to grow from those roots. What wonderful roots, what nurturing roots, what powerful supports that came from this institution. Uh, after getting his, back, his undergraduate degree here, off to where? UMass Medical School. We fought to get that medical school. And think about all the wonderful things that have been happening as a result of that. And all the wonderful <coughs> people that you sent from this institution to work with the medical teams that are at UMass Medical. <coughs> from there, as well, uh, excuse me, a medical degree from UMass Medical School, as well as a master's degree in clinical research from Emory University's Rollins School of Public Health, and an MBA from Emory's Business School. Now, again, go back. <coughs> Never thought that all of these things were going to happen. Took the opportunities that presented themselves. Worked as hard as he possibly could. Completed postdoctoral fellowships in critical care. And was recognized by the National Institutes of Health as a sickle cell research scholar in 2008. Uh, his outstanding father, an emeritus faculty member of this institution. Mother, teacher in the schools in this community. What a family. What an amazing family that we are associated with at this great university, our neighbors, our friends. So, Dr. Siegel, I just want to say that it has been an honor to meet you today. We in the public system of higher education are so, so, so proud of you and what you've accomplished. And we are looking forward this morning to hear what you have to say about developments in medicine and neuroscience from a physician's perspective. Thank you very much. First, let me say thank you very much for uh, coming out today. It's an extreme pleasure and honor on my end to uh, be here this morning. It was um, a surprise to be invited here and an even greater surprise to have the number of special individuals who uh, were kind enough to grace me with their presence today and of course to have all of you out here. And so hopefully I'll uh, have some entertaining things to discuss with you all this morning. Um, certainly as you all are aware, things uh, have gotten pretty hectic for me over the last six months or so. And about, I guess, May of last year or so, I was um, honored by this university as a young alumnus. And I came back to see Worcester State after being in the South for quite a bit of uh, years recently. And I came back to see a Worcester State University had grown tremendously from what I remembered as an undergrad. Certainly being here and seeing Gladys and many faces out in the audience today makes me feel like a bit of a reunion. And it's nice to be here. As anybody has probably heard, I have a lot, a lot of ties to uh, Worcester State. A lot of ties to the city, my family, my friends, and so forth, are all from here. And so this is a bit of a homecoming for me. Um, the way my schedule is not very often I get to travel to places. So this is uh, a bit of an enjoyable trip on my end. Now, when I was first uh, when I was first asked to talk, I um, I was asked to give a lecture. Okay. And so you have to understand in my world, when you say a lecture, I think a lecture. <laughs> so you guys are getting a lecture. <laughs> right, so if anybody wants to give me credit, this might actually qualify. Um, so in thinking about this, I wanted to talk about a few different things. And I think one of the things that has come to light in particular from my end as a result of the tragedy that occurred was that we all have to look at healthcare in a variety of different ways. 
As a physician, I'm very much immersed on the clinical side of things. My world is myself, my patient, the multidisciplinary teams we have in trying to get that patient better. Right? But as everybody's aware, healthcare is a huge component of everything for all of us in multiple ways. And so what I hope to sort of share with you all today is a bit of a sort of a tale of two sides. One will be pretty much my perspective of what I'm learning and what we have to move healthcare to from a quality perspective of medicine in general. So hopefully um, you'll get something valuable out of it. Now I do have to share one brief story with you all. Um, it was, I think it was last Thursday, I was uh, going to see the congresswoman on my regular visits. And um, I, her, her mom is a pretty uh, amazing woman herself, and she has a very strong family. And I think that's a large part of why she's doing so well. When I run a neuro rehab side of the fence, we work very hard to push the patients to continue to work hard. And uh, she's done an amazing job with the m number of hours of physical therapy that she goes to. And I have a variety of patients. Not everybody is as motivated as compliant as she is, but she's very much uh, interested in getting better. And I want to share with you all that she is doing well. On top of that, um, as I was walking out the door, her mom came up and said, so I hear you're going to be talking in Worcester next week. Uh, you tell them I said hello, you do a good job. So I'm going to pass that along to you. So, like with most lectures, you give your disclosures, and uh, I'm funded for uh, a couple of trials in, um, by the National Institute of Health looking at stroke and traumatic uh, brain. And I uh, just got a puppy, and I had no place else in the slide. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't have any children, but I have a puppy. <laughs> All right. So, I saw this quote when I was a fellow, and I found it interesting. You know, medicine is the only profession in labor that has to to destroy the reason for its own existence. All right, if you think about it for a minute, if Will actually was successful in eradicating all disease, I'd be unemployed right now, which would probably be a problem, but it's one of those things that we actually hope we get to that point where we can make impacts and differences. Now, when we talk about healthcare in America, I think, you know, in the old model, it was pretty much you worried about yourself and the physician and your loved ones and so forth. If anybody's been paying any remote attention to what's going on in our current healthcare economy uh, and what have you, you know that healthcare is a huge, huge component of that. Right? It makes up almost 20% of the GDP for our current for our nation. And so what I wanted to share with you all is that it doesn't matter where you are in, your, in the perspective of healthcare, but as consumers of the healthcare product, right, there's a lot of things that are changing in how you're going to interface with healthcare in the future. I think it's important on some level that you become familiar with it. So for those of you who are coming up into healthcare, the terms up here are very familiar to you. Right? For those who aren't, you know, you have Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, you have Agency for Healthcare Quality and Research. These are also the familiar terms in which these are the players in the game that are helping to shape the way healthcare is going to look like. The top one says value-based purchase. I'm going to sort of get into that a little bit, primarily share with you, well, what initially as we go through is going to seem somewhat Concerning, but I, I tend to look at it more as an opportunity to for what we can do and change within our healthcare system. And the HCAP system, right? What's sort of interesting about that in particular is when we think about consumers of any particular product, one of the things we think about if you were to go someplace and purchase something, you want to know that what you're purchasing is satisfied with that product. We're finally moving to a point in healthcare where not only how we deliver healthcare is important, but whether or not you are satisfied with what you get out of it, and it's an opportunity for you, the consumer, to verbalize back to the healthcare providers how we did taking care of you. So this is a long, drawn out sentence, but I've highlighted the part that I think is most important. Right? The idea of value-based purchasing, effectively, of healthcare purchasing is that buyers should provide, should hold providers of healthcare accountable. Right, so those of you who are participating in the healthcare environment you know, as consumers, you need to hold people like myself and the hospital systems accountable for what we do. And the old model was pretty much, okay, if you came to the hospital, you were sick. Your whole goal was to get out and feel better. Well, in our today's environment, we're saying, okay, we're going to be in mercy for providing that health care. But not only do we want to get better, right, but we want to know that the way you got us better was the best that it can be done. And so it's a slightly different approach. And this whole concept, in reimbursing healthcare providers and healthcare systems based on the quality that they perform has created a ripple effect in multiple institutions across the country in the way we deliver healthcare. And I'll touch a bit more on that. 
But this is always one of my favorite quotes. Right? Necessity is the mother of all inventions. And it truly applies here. Because without some of the crisis that we have now, I don't think the change that we're going to envision in the future would be possible. And so the necessity that's going on is the cost side of things. Right? The reality of it is simple. At the rate in which healthcare expenditures are growing, it's going to be extremely difficult to maintain. Right? In the early 60s, the some of our healthcare systems were developed. Uh, from a reimbursement perspective, the life expectancy was in the 60s. Well, now it's in the 80s, all right? And now we found that we've advanced medicine and technology to such an extent that people are living longer. And as people are living longer, how we pay for that and how we survive in that environment is extremely important. And so one of the low-hanging fruits, so to speak, is the necessity, if our cost is the necessity, I think the invention, one of the inventions we're going to see is quality. Right, which means to the extent that we can be stewards of providing quality health care to the world in the cost effective, efficient manner that still provides you with the end products that you want, is going to make impacts and differences in how we go forward. So I'm going to show you a couple of slides that can be a little bit concerning and troublesome. But I think the reality of it is we've gone from a system of paper and verbal communication to, I guess, texting and internet and what have you. And so I think that some of the challenges that were there before, that are here now, was that there before was just a matter of we have a better way of disseminating them so they become much more mainstream. And so you have a magazine like Forbes discussing healthcare, both in the comparison from uh, big hospital centers to small hospital centers. You talk about how 200 patients who spend the night or more in the hospital will die from a medical error. One in 16 may pick up an infection. Death from preventable hospital infection may exceed 100,000 or more. These are scary statistics, right? That's the unfortunate reality of some of our health systems. However, right, we are still one of the most technologically advanced systems and the most resource systems in the world, which means we have an opportunity to do that, all right? We have a variety of one-sided brain surgery. This is one of my favorite skits here, okay? Um, <laughs> In light of what we're finding that uh, one of the things we want to do, and that is important, is to say, okay, the public should be aware of how safe they're going to go into. Right? And so philosophically, I agree with the idea of public awareness, public knowledge, and so forth. From a healthcare side, from a physician's perspective, we are somewhat concerned about the concept of lists and rankings. Right? And so we want you to be aware the concept of those, however, is challenging. Anybody a sports fan in the group? College football, college basketball. Do you think I can get any of you guys together and agree on the BCS rankings? <laughs> Probably not, right? Well, imagine the discussion on that. You're going to have the same thing on this end. I think from our Intel care provider, that's the aspect that we're going to worry about. It's not so much that we don't want the consumers to know. We just want people to understand that the rank does not mean this is the best hospital, that is the best hospital. Uh, important aspects of that. So how did this happen? Right? How did we get to this point? Well, let's go back and look. All right. Now, granted, uh, this is a picture of a physician going to see his patient in the, uh, in the morning. And clearly, he's not in Houston, Texas. So that seems a little bit cold there. All right. And I want you, I'm going to show you a couple of slides, but I want everybody to sort of, kind of, as I go through them, just sort of think about the images you're seeing for a moment. Okay. Here's a doc in a patient's home after doing a procedure and enjoying a cup of coffee. Back then, house calls, time with your patients, 
a significant number of the physician population that were generalists. Uh, in the ICU setting, this particular one is very important to us. You know, you can't drink coffee in the middle of the ICU anymore. Okay? Um, the long hours of it, that's about the only thing that seemed to stay on both sides of the fence. All right. Now, you know, a lot of our practice is hospital and office based. Uh, the typical office visit is only 15 minutes, and if you look at those images, it seemed like they weren't rushed. Right? And that's where we are now. Our health care is more specialized. When I was in medical school at, at UMass, I remember working with a surgeon during my clerkship period. At that particular time, he had, he, was, he had been practicing long enough where he had effectively grandfathered into being able to do general surgery, colorectal surgery, vascular surgery. Whereas now, by the time, in order for you to do that, you have to do three different fellowships in order to do the same. Right, we've certainly become far more specialized in our approach to care. If anybody noticed, not one person had a glove or a gown or anything else. Jacob would be all over us if we uh, <laughs> went down that road. This is a picture of what a 70s medical bag uh, may look like, okay? Some medications and what have you. This is what we progress to. Larger teams, all right? Technology. It's, our healthcare system is changing, and I think part of what we're talking about when it comes to healthcare is we have to change the world. All right? If you're in the 50s and you had a heart attack, Bed rest, you, uh, the doctor, the nurse was effectively your treatment team. Now, if you have a heart attack, that same heart attack, fast forward, you're going to get a beta block or an aspirin, another medication. You may get IV thrombolytic or clot busted agents. You may get rushed to an uh, angio suite to get catheterization, all sorts of things. All right, you're going to get an EKG, a chest x ray, an echocardiogram. I mean, you know. From that simple thing you may have gotten in the 50s to where you are now, just the difference in that, obviously cost is going to increase with that. Right? But the care is um, a certain improvement change. The number of people that you're going to see, you're going to see your doctor. You're going to see several doctors now, right? The diet, the doctor in the emergency department, the hospitalist will probably take care of you on the inpatient side, the cardiologist is going to see you, all right? your nurse. I remember when I was first doing production as a fellow, we didn't have a farm new rounding with us, and I can't survive without one. Right? PT, OT, all sorts of players, and these are the people that you're in the hospital environment as a patient, you're gonna interact with all of these people. Right? So there are some challenges with all of this, okay? They're the unfortunate aspects of being more sophisticated, using more technology, <coughs> have created variability in forever. So those are the things that we need to try and buy out of the system. There's also things that we as consumers can do as well, all right? And that's the preventative side of the things, okay? Whether well, it's things like smoking or vaccinations or things of that sort, these are things that we can do that aren't necessarily costly that we can do to contribute to our own health care. Overuse, all right? 40 to 60% of the patients with a common cold are given antibiotics. <coughs> I'm guilty of this, all right? I don't know how many times I've sat there and I know that it's a common cold is viral probably doesn't need antibiotics. My patient is looking at me, red eyes, and sniffling, and saying, ah, oh, I need something, and, just, and we bargain, and we negotiate, and at the end of the day, I say, okay, fine, here you go, here's a little something. All right, the patient needs to understand, we need to understand. To some degree, some of the practices and efforts to sort of get better, may actually create some downstream problems for us. The last one, uh, temp set of coronary artery bypass are either inappropriate or equivocal. Now, for those of you who don't know what a coronary artery bypass is, effectively taking a vessel from a distal part and taking out the diseased vessel in your heart and grafting that vessel there so that you can return normal flow to that area. All right. So it's a fairly common procedure nowadays. And you think something that invasive, how could you have an equivocal component of that? But I wanted to share with you a recent story of my where one of my colleagues' um, wife's sister was actually a patient. And unfortunately, she has a severe adrenal disease as a transplant, on a transplant list. And in the evaluation for her transplant, the physician, um, in an effort to be a good steward, also decided to take a look at her heart. Now, she had had a stress test before, a normal EKG, and effectively was doing well from those perspectives. So in a routine setting, you wouldn't go any further. But then she had an angiogram of her heart, and effectively showed that 70% of the vessel in one of her, of her coronary vessels was, uh, was closed off. And so, at that point, he made the decision to go ahead and put a stent in there to open it up. All perfectly reasonable and what have you. 
on any other model that should come from a primary care doctor at that age, got the stress test, what have you, she would have never gotten those things. Okay? So in an effort to be a good steward, unfortunately, the renal failure and the blood thinners that come along with having a stent placed in there, she bled. Right? She had to suffer a stroke. And now, from my perspective, I'm, long, I'm left with a difficult situation. I need to stop the blood thinner so that the stroke doesn't expand. But if I stop the blood thinner, I'm worried that since she's had this done in a fairly decent amount of time, she may have proved that. Right? And you say equivocal because now you went from a situation where if she was going through a normal route, she probably would have never had that. She goes through this route in an effort to help her out, and we now have this situation. So we try and grasp what is equivocal about some of these things. It's very hard in real time to sort of assess what's going to happen and how we can sort of think of the downstream effects. Most people, uh, if you're into um, sort of healthcare quality, may have heard of this case. And it's an unfortunate tragedy, but it really points out some of the challenges in our system. There's an infant in a, in a, in a Denver hospital who was being treated for general syphilis and was given a penicillin. This is a routine treatment. And 150,000 units of what was ordered. Charles is 1.5 billion units ID and unfortunately passed away. So after reviewing the case uh, by uh, Dr. Cohen for the Institute of Medicine, they found that there were over 30 different places in which the error occurred. These were system errors. In other words, if, you, if I just told you that happened, you'd say, okay, either the doctor screwed up or wrote the order, the nurse screwed up and gave the order, or the pharmacist who screwed up and gave who delivered the drug. Exclude those three or 30 different areas in which the error could have occurred. Right, that could have and these are the things from a systems perspective. How do we create systems that are better for us so that we minimize these number of errors in an environment that's gotten increasingly complex? Right? This is what the order looked like. Right? And at first you say, okay, how did this happen? 150 pounds. There's two additional zeros there. Right? Any of you have seen me handwrite? It's not very far off from this. I am, I be, is that what it is? There's nothing here that says that it's an infant, an adult. The pharmacist who happen to be in this case typically takes care of adult patients. 1.5 million units is a normal adult dose. Right? That's where the challenge is. All right, so the reality of it is is to air is here. And in a system where we have linked humans not just a doctor and a nurse anymore, but 10 plus people in any routine engagement when you come to the hospital, you're going to have the opportunity to there. Right? And if, if anybody's familiar with this quote, right, the second half of the quote is the one you rarely ever hear. Okay? But to forgive is divine is the second half of the quote. Right? And it comes from a criticism of a way to address this. It makes sense. But to every single is divine. The challenge though is in our particular environment, a little bit better than the same to forgive as divine. Right? We have to say that by the time we're saying to forgive as divine, that every system we've created in that mantra has allowed us to minimize the number of errors. So if these errors do occur, we try to provide out as much uh, variability as possible. <coughs> healthcare is complex, okay? <laughs> so if you think about high quality healthcare, and that's really where we want to get to. That's really sort of the message I want to leave with you guys when it comes to this. Our technology is wonderful. All right. We have wonderful, intelligent, motivated people in the healthcare system. All right. We all want to get better. We just have to do the things to get us to a point where we have safe, effective, patient centered, timely, efficient, and equitable healthcare for everyone. Right. And at times, if crisis is what leads us to change, and that change is good for everybody, I want everybody to think of the healthcare situation and not necessarily look at it wow, all is going on, we're going to be in trouble, we're going to be bankrupt, and this or that, but look at it this way. As a necessity of all of this that's going on, you may actually have an opportunity to make sure you do better, or the best you can whenever you come to the hospital. One of my colleagues, a neurosurgeon, and Dr. Clifford, wrote a book called Flatline. Uh, after spending two years at the Robert Wood Johnson uh, Foundation specializing in healthcare, he comes up with these seven points. Right? And I agree with these seven points, except I've added eight. The eighth point is effectively that we need to the preventative side of things and make sure we encourage the consumers to do their part. The amount of disease that can be lessened or removed when people stop smoking, things of that sort of significant. Alright? The key components 
that and how the system is changing is when you take the value-based purchasing, you take the challenges in the healthcare quality system, you now add that reimbursements are changing and we're focused on quality. What that means now is we have to take all these components, bring them together into a multidisciplinary environment to help improve the system. So at Memorial Hermann Hospital and at many hospitals across the world and across the country, we've now created a vice chair of quality at the departments, of the medical school departments, we're partnering with the hospital saying, okay, we need to make sure that our doctors, our nursing staff, and everybody are all on the same page about quality, right? And it's part of that role that I am now, after assuming my particular university, that's making me far more aware about these particular components of things than I was before. All right, let's switch gears for a moment, all right? So the part that I can do um, on a more day-to-day -day basis is take care of patients who have suffered from some form of pain, right? And while we just finished talking about the healthcare system in general, I want to sort of drill it down now to neurosciences. And for me, it's, I love what I do, all right? An average day for me is 16 to 18 hours a day, six to seven days a week, all right? And in the course of that time, as a, as a director of the unit, I'm on call everywhere and anywhere. And so the, the, that aspect that we may be challenging and time consuming and tired, but at the same time, I not express to you how when you made a difference or somebody really gets better, it makes it all tremendously work. Those long hours are actually okay. Now, I was thinking of a picture this week, and I took a picture. Every once in a while I try and, you know, since I'm not having a group that's going to sort of be a different, uh, different levels when it comes to medicine, I just want to say if I can bring you a picture of something that you may be able to use a recent event to help crystallize it, I'd like to do that, okay? So I don't know how many of you remember the unfortunate incident to Liam Neeson's wife, Natasha Richardson, right, who had a, what seemed like a minor skiing accident and then developed a headache and then shortly passed away. And people threw the words around, she had a brain hemorrhage, an epidural hematoma, or whatever the case may be. Well, I had a 20-something-year-old patient who came with one of the most classic educational epidural hematomas you would see. All right, and this is what it looks like. And so, as you can see, this is the brain in the center. The white part is the blood. Right, and as it's pushing into a significant part of the brain. And in this particular uh, disease process, because it's an arterial blood, it bleeds so quickly that it can go from doing okay to doing very poorly. And in this unfortunate, uh, this fortunate case of this uh, person, she was in a car accident, so she came to the hospital as part of a car accident, walking, talking, and what have you. She was in my intensive care unit, and at 2 o'clock in the morning, she stopped talking. Right, because of what was going on here. Got rushed, the, got rushed to the operating room, an underwear procedure, and a day or so later, I got her off life support. Right, but this is sort of what we were referring to, that if you weren't in the right environment, fortunately, this could come back to the Times have changed, all right? You know, x-rays, CT scanners, MRI, take a look at the time frame. It hasn't been that long since the CT scanner and MRI have uh, evolved, all right? And I was talking to Dr. Clifton and so talking to Dr. So earlier today, we talked about what uh, some of the <coughs> approaches to managing diseases were. You know, uh, if somebody had a brain tumor and you wanted to sort of figure it out, you would jet dye into the base of the skull and you would then take x-rays and you would see where the blood vessels went and where there were distortions and it is where you guessed the tumor was. Crack open as much of the skull as you can so that you could get as much exposure and you would see what you could do. Right? Now, times have really improved and we have more sophisticated ways to Right? And this is only in the 70s. And as we go through more images, we'll fast forward to some of the amazing things that we're able to do now. And why, when I say I think neuroscience is the next frontier, the brain doesn't have to be uh, an organ that we're afraid to learn about or just something in this black box that we don't know much about. Um, it's, it's impressive. Just a bit of a timeline. Equal present can be created. First report in the 1890s, although many believe that there was some form, form of it, even well beyond that. Endovascular surgery is probably one of the, the coolest things that's going on now, and, um, and we'll go through a bit of that. I wanted to share with you, because from my particular, one of the largest disease processes that has the most impact on most people is stroke. Right? And I wanted to just give you a brief primer on that particular item. Okay? Stroke is the third leading cause of death, but it's, the number, it's one of the leading causes of morbidity. And uh, in when we think of stroke, the group part represents a stroke that's from a, a clot, okay, a, a, a 
blood doesn't travel to the further parts beyond that clot, and so you don't get blood flow to that particular area. The other 12 to 15 percent is the bleeding time. Right? That 12 to 15 percent is the one that causes the most damage. Right? That's the one that has a higher chance of harming or killing. Now, in one of our sessions, we continue to do a few challenging cases and see what we do. And so we had a young woman come in with what we call a subarachnoid hemorrhage, a bleeding type of stroke. And when you have a certain gradation of this, okay, it's so severe that 90 plus percent of these patients, they come and will not survive uh, that hospital visit. Right? And very often, in, um, in the early part of my career, I would have to go into the family members' room and say, I don't believe love to make it past this. Well, the last year or so, we actually compiled more of our cases to find that even patients that we thought were like that, with the amount of support we can give them, a lot of them are actually developing more of a fighting chance to get through that. And such was the case with this particular woman who uh, came in with that, and as a result of the bleed there, her heart suffered as a result, and she had a heart attack at the same time. All right, so you've got me, the intensivist, and I'm trying to manage different sides of the care, okay? You've got the cardiologist, I want to say, hey, her heart's bad. Keep her blood pressure low. Her heart doesn't need to work that hard. I've got my neurosurgeon on the other side saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. Raise her blood pressure up. I've got to make sure she doesn't stroke out, all right? Here I am saying, okay, which way do I go? Which way do I go? All right. Now, how you decide that becomes very much the practice out of the medicine, and you have to make an individual case by case assessment. But what I thought was somewhat poignant, and I'm obviously going to be biased on you know, sciences, and I take care of your patients, so I might rank the brain a little bit higher. Right. And when I think of that, one of my colleagues said, well, actually, my little surgery colleague said, well, listen, I'd rather die from my heart attack than live with my stroke. And maybe pause for a second. Think about that. Say, I'm going to die from my heart attack and of my stroke. All right. Now, we've done a tremendous amount in the way of, of uh, cardiac disease. And if you have a significantly damaged heart, you can still function to some degree. Right? You might not you know, play basketball necessarily, but you can still function. When you lose your mind, it's a different type of dysfunction. All right? And that's the challenge. Is if you survive this and have a major stroke and left in a vegetative state, that's a very difficult thing. And many people, they would rather die than live in that situation. Right? So it made us all pause and think. And so this is sort of the routine day-to-day -day decision that we have to go through. Right? In the evolution of what we're talking about in medicine, right, once TP or clot busting came out, came the evolution of stroke centers. Right? And the effect that we're saying is, just like we did with the heart, we want to do with the brain. So let's go to places that are specially designed to manage stroke. Because if you go to those places, they can improve the care for the patients far much better, uh, much better than if you go to the average hospital that's just simply close. So they developed two levels of designation, a primary stroke center and a comprehensive stroke center. All right, the comprehensive stroke center, what we do differently there is we go far deeper into the level of diagnostic and therapeutic things that we can do that quite frankly border on being very risky. But we're able to do that because Neurosurgery, the neurocritical care, the neuro rehab are all centered there. And as a team, we're far better equipped to handle that. Okay? And that's the basic level of differentiation. And also, that level of differentiation, we provide it 24 hours a day. Right? And that's what makes it. So, as stroke knowledge and stroke care improve, the system, the federal systems around it also improve. This is what a stroke from a clot may look like. Once an area of tissue dies, it dies. The goal when we get to the hospital the area around that, um, that area that's died is still viable, and our goal is to preserve as much of that so that when you get to the rehab side of the phase, you have as much of your brain tissue there eligible to learn and train and resume as much for a normal function as possible. So TPA, clot busting, everybody's familiar with it from heart disease, get to the hospital, if you have chest pain, you get to the hospital as quick as possible. Now you're seeing commercials, if you have a stroke like symptoms, get to the hospital as quick as possible. Right. With TPA, you can give it anywhere from three to four and a half hours. Let me show you. The sooner you do it, the better of a chance you have. Now, there's certainly, as once you get beyond that, the risk and benefit ratio changes. But at a comprehensive center, one of the things we're able to do is take patients who have strokes in particular areas that are a bit more high risk and say we can do more directed therapy. So if we can take the normal TPA that we give to the veins, we may take catheters and go right up to uh, the area intra-arterially little bit TPA, okay? Now when you do that, there's obviously more risk associated with that. But what I wanted to show you was 
if you look here, that's what the CT image of the patient looked like. All right? Nothing particularly remarkable there. Here, where this first arrow is, is where the clot is. And if you look at both sides, all right, this is what we're looking at. You see blood flow vessels on this side. Notice the absence of it here. All right? You inject. After injection, you now have blood flow on both sides. That's the goal of what we're trying. Risky procedure, which was you have to be in a specialized <coughs> to do this. Cool toy, all right? So imagine now, um, you can take a catheter through the groin, go to where the clot is in the brain, take a device like this, and actually remove the clot and can all right? Mind you, now if we sit and have an academic discussion of, we have all these fancy toys, how much does it improve? The system of improvement is very diverse. We have a so called all player role, how they get supported from the ICU players. But my goal is here is that we've grown a lot from the 1950s with that one doctor, but happy to sort of the things we can do now. The bleeding type of the stroke. Right? When you have a bleeding type of the stroke, of stroke, one of the things we do now that has been done for years is the ability to remove a component of the skull, right? which is very similar to what we had to do for our accomplishment victims point so that if any swelling that occurs, the brain can accommodate that until such a time as people do. This is kind of a more gross looking picture, but I couldn't resist not putting it in. <laughs> Alright. Um, so here's a patient. Now one of the things that unfortunately affects young kids in particular, when we talk about strokes and things that we always think of it as, you know, 60 year old, 70 year old or what have you, we're seeing 20 year olds who are getting involved now. Okay? And when they get involved it's from different so here we have what we call an ABM, which means the artery side of the fence, the vein side of the fence, they get all jumbled together, so to speak, all right? When you get jumbled together, the blood flow through there is not the way it should be, and it can bleed. And when it bleeds, it becomes catastrophic. So here, this is what the ABM looks like. All right, the little jumbled up black stuff there is where all the mixed up blood vessels are. So we took the catheter, entered into there, okay, and put coils to that particular area, we call it embolizing area. The idea is to stop the blood from going there. And as you can see, from here to here, there's much less uh, blood flow in that area, okay? Uh, so here, what I wanted to show you was, if you take a look at the images here, you have another aneurysm, all right? And now, we're gonna combine a few different things, okay? So I want to show you one, CT scanner, angiogram, we look at this as well. This is a 3D radiographic image of what we're looking at. Right? Now, in order to <coughs> achieve treatment here, two things need to be the, the, the way the aneurysm is surrounded around the blood vessel. Once again, through the groin, all of this is done without ever cutting the patient. Okay? So going through the groin, a stent is placed around the vessel to protect the integrity of this vessel while you include this area here so that you can destroy this without having to sacrifice the entire vessel, which might have had to have been done in the past. And not a decision is made in the person's head at all. all right. Now we're in breath with you. You see that same vessel, all right, and it's gone. All right. So those are the techniques. When I get excited about it, I want you to get excited about it. <laughs> different things going on in the, in the neurosciences. When I was in medical school, I didn't want to go into Right, because you had a stroke and so you know, the audience you know, will break the detectives, they can tell you you had a stroke. They can tell you what the stroke was. But now that's changed a lot, right? We are really, really making significant advances. In the ICU, we do a variety of different things because once you've had the surgery, you spend the next bit of time trying to get out of the hospital. And what happens in this part determines wonderful surgery can be destroyed by bad critical care, right? Bad surgery can sometimes be healthy. So this is my uh, this is my hospital. I, yeah, when I, I when I started there a little over two years ago, this facility was opened about a month before. So I was fortunate enough to inherit a brand new ICU. <coughs> this is one of my nurses taking care of one of my patients. Very uh, challenging situation. The thing that I want to show you here is in the good old days you had sort of an open format, right? You walk in and all the patients would be surrounded, and the nurses would sort of take care of you, kind of see things. But we want to be patient centered. So if you look at this room here, you've got a bathroom over in the corner there. You actually have an area for a family to sleep and a couch in there. And I can accommodate all of this equipment all in one patient's room. All right. The nurse typically takes care of a two to one ratio. And the monitor there, it's difficult to see, is split in half. 
the right side is this patient's vitals, the left side is the other patient's vitals that you see. So anytime you reach the female, she doesn't lose sight of what's going on. All right. When a patient has any neurologic change, which for us is always worrisome and figure, okay, what's going on? Typically, you have to take the patient and go down to where the radiographic scan is. So you have to move all of this and travel down someplace in radiology get the image, bring them back up, somebody has to load it and read it and figure out, hey, all right, what are we going to do about this? This is our portable CT scan. This gets wheeled into the patient's room. Take the image, I get to look at it right then and then, I get to make the decisions I need to make um, whenever the patient comes in. So when, we were the, when uh, the congresswoman's husband was deciding which places to go to, our ability to be able to handle any particular emergency that come up was one of the things they factored into this, whether or not she should We all are familiar with oxygenation. But when your body gets oxygenation with the brain and injured, it doesn't necessarily get the same degree of oxygenation. So we're able to measure brain tissue oxygenation in particular areas. All right? We're able to measure the oxygen difference in what the brain is utilizing versus the rest of the body. All right? We're able to put probes in people's brains and see what the pressure is like. So imagine when you come in, you could have a hole for that, a hole for your neck for that, and another hole for that, and a temperature monitor, okay? There's a lot of holes going on there. All right? So all that to tell you that I think a tremendous, tremendous amount we've accomplished from a technological perspective, right? And we really, really believe those of us who are in this room just to keep getting things. It's far more for us to do, far more for us to learn, right? And it's an exciting period of time. And however we manage things from a healthcare perspective, we have to preserve that particular ability for myself, the other component of it is research. Right? We want to make sure we take care of our patients, but we also want to, know, also want to continue to advance research to the extent that we can provide the latest and best care for our patients. And the two areas that I'm particularly involved in are traumatic brain injury and stroke. Right? Uh, Dr. Pilton has done a lot of hypothermia work. He sits along with practicing in my group has inherited a lot of that work, and we're going to be continuing hypothermia. I was remarking with somebody, uh, when he first started doing his hypothermia trials in the 90s, to get somebody to put ice pack here and they gave a cooling blanket over there. Now I put a catheter in your groin and that's it. And I can cool you to 37 degrees in a matter of hours. <laughs> Lots of shame. That groin gets a lot of work, by the way. <laughs> um, one, of the, one of the fun things that I'm involved with is uh, right now we're looking at patients who have an acute stroke. Right, within the first couple of days, we're taking on holiday stem cells, which means we're harvesting the patient's own stem cells from their bone marrow, transplanting into them. And because it's autologous, they don't necessarily be like a typical transplant. A lot of immunosuppressant drugs or anything like that. And we're one of the first centers to do this in humans. And we're sort of now we're starting to look at it, publish our safety data and saying that we're able to do this. We've done this in about 20 plus patients now. And we find we're starting to look at the data and see how, better, how much better they're doing. But we're able to say that we're able to do this now such an extent that we are now expanding the stem cell component to traumatic brain injury patients, and we're also um, extending to patients who've had a stroke as far out as six months. We're hoping that the, uh, the transplantation of the stem cells will, um, will invigorate even patients who suffered a stroke six months ago. Now, the way we currently do it is we simply uh, give you back the stem cells through intravenous uh, medication. For the six-month group, we're actually looking at same catheter again and actually do a more directed injection of the stem cell to see if we get an even better response than that. So in summary, I want to say that we have challenges in our healthcare system, right? And healthcare reform now needs to be both innovative and comprehensive. Right? And whatever we do to do that, we have to make things our technological advances. We have to make sure that we continue to progress medicine and science to the extent that we continue to provide as best of care for you all as possible. Top of doing that, we also have to make sure we provide effective quality utilization risk and infection management programs. And not only do we get you to make sure you have the access to it, we continue to drive technology to such an extent that you have the ability to have these advances available to you. And when you're in this environment, that the things that you receive are as safe, as effective, and as efficient for you as possible. Right? And hopefully we see this. Well, I love it all that all that's going on is still really an exciting time for medicine. Those of you who haven't decided what careers you want to go into, medicine is still a good place to go, okay? Questions? <laughs>